Hi and welcome. My name is Becky Senf. I'm the Chief Curator here at the Center for Creative Photography. And tonight Mark and I are going to talk about his collaborative practice. It's, um, it's a little tricky to do a talk about collaboration without all of Mark's collaborators here. So I am going to do my very best job of simulating some of those other voices. Unfortunately, I, I don't do voices, so you're just going to have to bear with me in quoting Mark's collaborators. Um, before we get into the program, I want to mention that following the talk, we're going to have books for sale. We have copies of Mark and Byron and Rebecca Solnit's brand new Drowned River from Radius Press, brand new book. And there'll be copies of that for sale, and Mark will be able to sign them. And additionally, we have a few copies of Camino del Diablo for sale as well, another Radius book. Um, and then I just want to mention that if you're here local to Tucson, on May 10th, I'm going to be doing a tour of the two exhibitions, the Ansel Adams and Mark Klett, uh, during the lunch hour. And you're welcome to join us and uh, see the exhibitions with the curator. OK. In case you came to this talk not knowing who Mark Klett is, maybe that happened, um, let me tell you a little bit about him. Um, his background includes working as a geologist before turning to photography. Mark has received fellowships from the Guggenheim Foundation, the National Endowment for the Arts, the Pollock Krasner Foundation, and the Japan-US Friendship C Commission. His work has been exhibited in the United States and internationally for over 35 years, including here at the Center for Creative Photography from March to May of 1993. Um, his work is held in over 80 museum collections worldwide. He is the author or co-author of 15 books, and he lives in Tempe, where he works as a Regents Professor of Art at Arizona State University, although we will not hold that against him. OK, so um, what we're going to do, I'm going to ask Mark questions, very often quoting some of his collaborators so as to bring their voices into the conversation. We're going to try and move through with some uh, forward motion so that we get to you all and have a chance for audience members to ask questions as well. So be thinking about that as we go along. Uh, but I'm going to start with one of Mark's regular collaborators, Byron Wolf, who um, was Mark and Byron first worked together when Byron was Mark's graduate student. He's now a professor of photography um, at the Tyler School of Photography at Temple University. And Byron gave me this definition of collaboration. Collaboration is distinct from partnerships, teamwork, or group work. I think of collaboration as a conscious and directed creative activity that is intended to be expansive and that results in the ampli amplification of ideas. In this framework, collaboration isn't about dividing up work or even working cooperatively towards a shared goal, but instead is about leveraging individual strengths to move beyond existing boundaries, or perhaps even working collectively to imagine something beyond any existing realities. Collaborations produce things that simply could not or would not have occurred if working alone. They are the best way I've found to generate new and unexpected lines of inquiry. Collaboration is to working alone as improv is to stand-up comedy. So, Mark, if you could react to that definition that Byron's given of collaboration and whether or not you agree with that or would you define it differently? Um, yeah. <laughs> I agree with that. Oh, good. OK, question number two. <laughs> I, I was just going to um, go to some pictures here, because being a visual guy, I don't know. Let's see. Uh, oh. I want to get some. Thank you, Brian. Yeah. You know, because I thought it would be good to show pictures of Byron at work. And so this was the Grand Canyon project. And um, you know, one of the reasons I like working with Byron, first of all, he puts up with me. Um, but and second, and we, have, we share the same kind of sense of humor. It's just very dry. And then um, you know, what he's saying about the, the idea of kind of generating things, uh, you know, it's one of the things that we do together. Uh, so this is, he didn't really want to do that, actually, <laughs> that, that picture. Uh, but it's kind of like the picture that we did in the in the beginning of the you have outside actually, and um, so 
you know, one of the things that we learned how to, we could do would be to um, kind of play off of each other a little bit and sort of see, you know, what would happen uh, if we tried something. Like this was the stereo that's in the other, uh, in the gallery in there. And <coughs> I remember when um, the iPad first came out about 2009, Byron said, we got to do something with this. And so we said, well, yeah, what are we going to do with it, you know? And well, how about video? So we decided to make this video of uh, walking around, you know, the, the rock. And um, so we kind of went to this place and set up, uh, if I can get this thing to work. Is it that one or the next one? No, it's this one. So maybe if I get off of this. Does that work? There it is. Okay. <laughs> so we said, well, how about if we try to get, like, walk into the stereo? And, and Byron goes, yeah, we can put together video and still photographs in the same uh, frame in Photoshop. So we figured out how to do it. We got these two little flip phones and put them together out there. And we did this, and we were laughing so hard we could barely uh, <laughs> walk. And then, uh, then we ended up uh, making this the viewer that's in the gallery. And you know, we, I'm, the first one um, I made, I had a machine shop make it. And then uh, he said he didn't like that, so he wanted to do it uh, himself. So he and his son printed this on their, on their uh, 3D printer at home, this, this whole thing. They designed it and printed it. So I think what, what I'm, I guess what I'm getting at is that um, a lot of what the way we work is it's really experimental and it's really experiential. And we don't know what we're going to do until we get out there. And the reason I like to keep working with him is it's just that it's a lot of fun. So did that answer the question? I think that answered the okay. question. Okay. Um, collaboration is now seen as fairly mainstream. And in fact, I'd even say some of us think of it as corporate, because those of us who work in institutions are often encouraged to collaborate and find ways to find efficiencies through collaboration. But I know I'm not sure that's collaboration, but well, okay, f fair enough. Sure. Um, but when you started in collaborating on the rephotographic survey project, you really thought of it as subversive. And so, could you talk a little bit about why was collaboration seen as subversive? Yeah. Let me go to. Uh, let me see if I can go to. Yeah, show us one of those crazy pictures of you project. guys camping. I'll go to the rephotographic survey project here. Yeah, so um, first of all, the whole idea behind rephotography is pretty simple, right? So, you know, you have like a picture like this, and you uh, try to find out where it's made, and then you make another one, and then you create this diptych. And as I said in the gallery, I hate the, I hate the idea of then and now, because it's not really very descriptive. When is then, when is now? But what happens is when you do this kind of work, uh, and we were doing stuff in the field, um, collaboration, that's Gordy Bishaw, uh, and he and I worked together on that, that image. You know, that, that um, what happens when you have a picture from the past is that when you go revisit it, you bring that picture from the past into the present. And then that picture ceases to become a part of the mausoleum, but instead becomes part of the present day that causes you to rethink what's happened in the history that was there. And the thing about rethinking history is it's a very dangerous thing because it can change things. I think you can actually change the history. And so in changing that, then you can change their thinking about the present, which then mushrooms into the future. So that's what I meant about the subversive part is that a lot of people don't like it when you mess with history. And what we were doing with this project, um, a lot of it was actually playing around with um, various uh, forms of, of uh, historical work. So like this is a picture by Jackson, um, Moraines on Clear Creek, which then uh, became this image, uh, Moraines on Clear, or uh, this reservoir. But then we would do stuff like, like this. Uh, that's Joanne playing Kiki. You know, <laughs> in uh, in that in that image. So we we had all these uh, variations 
of thinking about how to do things. Like this is Garden of the Gods. And then we would make these other pictures that we didn't know what to do with at the time. And then um, that's uh, how the picture was made there. That's collaboration. <laughs> <laughs> it was Joanne's idea. It wasn't, wasn't mine. But um, anyway, yeah. So uh, I kind of lost track of what you were asking me there. But well, <laughs> so um, part of part of collaboration is the is a shift in authorship too. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay. That's actually pretty interesting in relative to this project because I think when we started, uh, we had a methodology. Um, so the methodology is. You get a copy print of a picture. You go out in the field. You find out where it was made. You set up the camera in the same spot. Try to match the lighting and do it as precisely as possible. So I trained, um, you know, Gordy Bashaw, for example. This is this is Gordy, and you know, we I trained him and Rick Dingus and the other photographers on the project to do this work. We would all go out there and do the same thing. It's it's a little bit of a conceptual methodology, right? Where there's a there's a way that you do it. Uh, the question is, does it really matter who does it? And I think when we were first doing this project, the first year, Joanne Verberg and Ellen Manchester and I would all go together. And I couldn't remember who put the camera up. You know, we put the camera up there, take the picture. I don't remember who took the picture. We'd argue about whether it was good enough or not. And we'd come to a consensus until we realized it was good. And then that would be it. Well, at the end of that, we would say, this is a photograph by the Rephotographic Survey Project. We didn't have any names on it, because it didn't really matter. But as we got into the second and third year of the project, and we, had, we all split up, and we all went different places, and Gordy went to some place, and Rick went to some place else, and so forth, um, we realized we had to begin to think about authorship as part of the, the whole idea. You know, so um, we just changed it to, like, Rick Dingus for the Rephotographic Survey Project, or you know Gordon Bashaw for the Rephotographic Survey Project. So we had to we had to admit that there was some authorship. These are some of the side slides from that, and that's how I started on my own uh, work too. That's a picture I made of Joanne camping out in that that area. So eventually that led to our own personal work. So there was that sense of authorship coming out by the doing moving away from the methodology and then doing our own personal work after that. Well, and so if you weren't authoring individual pictures for a rephotographic survey project, how did you get paid? I mean, how did you make money when you sold the We didn't works? get paid. <laughs> 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 what, what do you think we're doing here? This wasn't a, we, this was not a business. You know? <laughs> we, what we ended up doing, um, we created these sets like this. And I think the center has a set. And so, um, there was 35 pair, pairs of prints in the set. So it was a 78 by 10s. And it's just what you have in the gallery. And uh, we charged a ridiculously cheap price for that. I think it was like 2000 bucks or $1,500 or something to start with. And we tried to sell them to collections. We didn't, we didn't keep them in the market. We decided we didn't want to sell them to get out there in the market. So we only sell them to public collections. Um, later, when I did third view, um, and we did, I managed to get enough money from the sale of these that I used that money to pay for, for Third View. And uh, Terry Etherton sold some sets here. He agreed to take less than a 50% commission. Um, and so we, you know, that's how we, we paid for stuff. You know, these site slides, and that was a picture I made of me at that site. <laughs> Self-portrait. This is really how I started to do my work, you know, off of this project, my personal work. Um. I'm going to quote Ellen Manchester, who was on the Rephotographic Survey Project. She's an art historian. And I had asked her what challenges there were in working with you, um, working <laughs> collaboratively. Um, and she, she said, quote, Mark tended to be very methodical, very strategic, the scientific mind. I think the challenge was mostly for him working with me. I tended to plunge ahead, often with only the slightest idea of where we were going with the project. I would tackle many things all at once and at the very last minute. And while we often clashed heads, over time we managed to develop a collaboration that respected each other's ideas and moved forward in many positive ways." End quote. So over time, you've collaborated with all kinds of different people. And I'm wondering if you have a method for 
figuring out how to work with lots of different styles, or is that an intuitive process for you? Or, I mean, is, how do you navigate that element of it? I don't know, you know, I don't think I have a formula. I, I uh, learned a lot with the Rephotographic Survey Project about collaborating with people, Ellen and Joanne and Gordy and Rick, and um, then it sort of went off from there. But, you know, I think the first thing is that people just need to respect one another, you know, and, and they're, I mean, each one of us brought strengths to the project, in this project. Uh, you know, Ellen was a historian. She knew a lot more about the history than I did. Um, she could bring that perspective, and she brought a sense of research to the project. I didn't know how to do research. I didn't understand the importance of research when we started this project, but I did once we got going. You know, Joanne was, was really good with using view cameras when we started, and she, and she and I were both interested in conceptual work, but I didn't know how to use a view camera very well. I learned a lot from her. Uh, you know, this is uh, Gordy Bashaw at the site of the Old Faithful, where you just saw, you know, Gordy was a really patient guy. There's like 3,000 people behind us complaining that we're in front of them and the geyser, you know. And that ranger was super excited. He was like, I never got this close before. You know? <laughs> and, and, you know, you have to travel with somebody that you can get along with and that you like. And, and he was just really steady. He was methodical. He was a mathematics teacher, and he really understood how to do the work. You know, and, and so, um, you know, I, I learned to kind of temper myself and to kind of understand how to, you know, work with people and use their strengths and, and, and rely upon them for things um, that really I hadn't, hadn't had experience with before. But I, I think in some ways I wasn't sure this whole thing was going to work, this whole project, you know. Uh, it was kind of like, well, if it doesn't work, you know, I guess we'll do something else. But I figured, like, I had nothing to lose. So in a way, when I started, I started collaborating because I needed other people. I didn't know how to do the work. I didn't know what we were going to do, how it was going to happen. We needed each other. And then after we did it, I kind of learned about how to work with other people. Excellent. Um, you mentioned a little bit uh, this notion of research informing the Rephotographic Survey Project. Mm -hmm. But I'm wondering if you could talk about the Rephotographic Survey Project as research. Oh, yeah, um, gee, I mean, um, let me break it down a little bit because, you know, so there's the research involved in getting historical images, even knowing that they're there. Um, <coughs> then there's the research involved in finding where they're located. I mean, now we just go on the internet, right, and we look this stuff up. In those days, we had to actually go there, and we had to, you know, find the images and copy them. Um, <clears throat> then, so what's involved in that? Who did it? Where was it taken? You know, can you get any other information out of it? Then you have to go out in the field and find it, you know. And so this is not that difficult a place. It's, it's El Moro. Anybody can drive there now. But some places were hard to find. So there's the re there's a kind of detective work that's involved in that. They're relating of an image to a real place uh, and how those two kind of fit together. Um, then there's, well, how do you do the work? I mean, do you, do you um, what kind of cameras do you use? Do you, how do you even locate the same precise point that the original photograph was made? So there's this trial and error thing that happens. I, th I think that what happens with photography and, and this kind of photography is that, you know, there's a, a kind of conceptual uh, umbrella under which it fits, which is a structure that this is the way the work's going to be done. Uh, we're going to find the exact spot, we're going to duplicate the lighting, and we're going to try to make it um, exactly the same and get the picture to look the same as much as we can. But then once you do the work, then you realize there's all these things that you didn't count on. Like did, we didn't know that O'Sullivan uh, penciled in the writing in this. And when we get there, it's not black anymore, you know. We didn't know that he, you know, cut that agave down to put the ruler up and then propped it up with a rock until we get there and that was a new agave, which they don't let you cut down, you know. <laughs> then we don't know that you know, Sullivan actually carved his own name in the rock, you know, something like that. And so there's this stuff that you find when you're out there and then you have to modify the, the, um, the methodology. And so there's this then modification that deals with an intuitive 
sense. So you're then taking one of the other main structures of photography, the intuitive method of making photographs and bringing that to conceptual structure. And so you have to then modify that. And so that is a kind of a form of research in the sense that you, if research is about knowing the unknown, then what happens when you get there is the unknown and then you have to do the work. Even though you think you have a structure under which to work, it doesn't usually operate that way. You have to modify the structure. Mm -hmm. Yeah, excellent. Um, all right, I'm gonna shift a little bit to third view. Okay. You can shift there. Uh, I'm gonna quote two of your former MFA graduate students and third view collaborators. That's me and Byron looking really idealistic <laughs> for this project. Um, so first I'm going to quote Kyle Bajakian. He said, quote, I'm also a musician, and what I love about playing music with other people is that it challenges the mind to juggle three balls at one time. You must listen to your own instrument and to the others and to the overall sound that's being created. Collaborating artistically requires the same letting go of the self and shouldering the collective's evolving sensibility, end quote. Really beautiful, right? Um, and then also another of the Third View collaborators, Toshi Yoshina, said, uh, quote, for me, the impression of Third View project was that it was like a small jazz band in music. There is the main theme and basic structures, but each of us improvise our own parts. And then the members get together to observe, discover, and learn to form the project, end quote. So I thought it was interesting that both of these Third View members compared the process of, of the Third View project to a musical ensemble. So I wondered if you had any musical background um, <laughs> and whether or not this musical analogy made sense to you. Well, Emily knows this story, but you know, when I was like in third grade, I went to the music teacher and I said, I, I wanna play an instrument. And she said, I'm really sorry, but you don't have the aptitude. <laughs> So she I'm turned sorry. me down, flat down. <laughs> That's why I'm a visual artist. But the thing, the thing was that I think she was right. So I'm not a musician, but this is the, this is the missing man photograph with Kyle wasn't with us. So this is the third view team actually with a missing chair for Kyle. Um, there actually is in the DVD in the other room. Um, if you navigate and noodle around enough on that DVD, there's actually a segment where Kyle is playing on a, on a, a guitar. And I'm playing the uh, pots with the pot handles. <laughs> so that was my musical thing. Um, but I think what happened with the so third view, unlike um, the rephotographic survey, and the RSP, when we were done with it, we all spread out. So Gordy was in, you know, in Nevada, and Rick was in Utah, and I was in Idaho, and, and, and we're all separate. When we did third view, I really wanted us to stick together. So this is the team, you know, Byron, Bill Fox, Mike Marshall, Toshi Oishina, and then the missing chairs for, for Kyle. And um, we, we went out as a team and then uh, we, would sep we would split up. Like I gave Kyle the, the uh, tape, the, it was a DAT recorder. I said, just record some sound, do interviews, whatever. And he would do that. Toshi would use the video camera uh, Bill was taking notes all over the place and Byron and I did the re-photography, but we'd all come together and compare stuff. And so it was kind of like a musical thing where we were splitting up, doing the work and coming back and then throwing it all together again and saying, what'd you get today? You know, what did we find? And we would collect artifacts, we would collect sounds, we would, we would get videos, we would have notes, we would have our own photographs, we would have re-photographs and all this stuff put together. That's what that DVD is. It's kind of like an improvised thing and then we would get back in the studio and go, wow, look at this you know, stuff we collected. And it all seems to fit. I mean, it comes together and we would then create something else out of it. So the, the re-photography became the excuse for going out and doing the work. But then the rest of it was all this more contextual stuff that was really important, that really said something about the place. And you could put history into the context of the present and all these little things would sort of, you know, matter at that point. Well, I'm, I'm just reflecting on that musical analogy. So in some ways you needed, you needed some kind of structure. I mean, it is like a jazz band, right? You've got mm -hmm. the structure, you've got the eight bar repeating structure, 
and then mm -hmm. that allows people the, the freedom to move around on top of it. Yeah, well, I think when you're working in photography, eventually you arrive at structure. Either the structure comes in the beginning because you have a conceptual plan and a structure that, that you work under, or it happens if you work intuitively and you, and you kind of follow your intuition, so to speak, but eventually you need to look at everything you've done and learn from it and then create structure out of that. Mm -hmm. But structure happens because you need it. And so what happens in projects like these, and when I look at the way people work, is they try to understand what they're good at. And so in third view, you know, like Kyle, and I, I'd send him out to get, um, to get something at the store, and he'd be gone four hours and like I'm trying to cook dinner, like Kyle, where's the stuff? And he'd come back, hey, I, got, I met this guy and I got this great interview. And I'm like, oh, that's great, Kyle. Where's the thing I need? Oh yeah, <laughs> I forgot about that, you know. <laughs> and and like Kyle was just not good at that kind of thing. But if you if I sent him out and said, go get me an interview or something, he'd be fantastic, you know. He I met this guy in a bar. It was like always a bar, you know. <laughs> and listen to what he had to say, and it'd be really good, you know. So. Um, I had to understand that about everybody, you know, and, and what they're good at, and then try to get them to do that. And so that, you know, they, they can create their own structure if you let them, but then you have to then sort of pull them back sometimes. And I wouldn't send Kyle out to get the groceries anymore. <laughs> that was my mistake, you know. <laughs> anyway. Right. <laughs> um, I just wanted to say that this is like, this is how we started <coughs> Third View. That's Byron's laptop, you know. The PowerBook <laughs> Duo 250, it was a black. And then this was, this was my first digital camera. And we used that, and, and uh, that was the first time we worked digitally on Third View. It was a 1.5 megapixel camera. It cost $800. <laughs> and we tried to load stuff on the web, and it was a total nightmare and, and, and from Nevada. But see, this is where, like, you know, Byron was really good at understanding how to get stuff out of really you know, Neolithic equipment, basically. Okay, I'm gonna shift a little bit to Water in the West, and I'm gonna call on one of our audience members, Martin Stupich. Um, Marty was one of the Water in the West members, and so Marty, I'm wondering if you would, for the audience, just describe Water in the West from your perspective, and then if you would be so kind as to ask Mark a question about that project. Sure, my uh, perspective is my perspective, a disclaimer, there were 10 of us, most of us consider ourselves artists, so of course no description by any one matched any other one of what the project was about. However, what I think it had in common, and Mark, you can help me uh, get this right, I think it was driven by um, an environmental agenda, s s a little bit heavy-handed political agenda about the use of water in the West historically, and uh, currently, and our place in trying to affect the conversation about that. The, my awareness very early on with the project, or with the, my collaborators, with my <coughs> associates, was that um, it probably wasn't as much a collaboration as it was a collection of disparate-minded people, all of whom had a uh, great passion about photography, and of course about the West and water as we all know in this room, uh, is central to that conversation. But it became clear to me early on that as we, we would meet, we, we were together, what, five or six years, Mark, before we sort of floated away. Um, but the project had a formal presence for about five or six years, and we would meet every six months to a year. And I realized that, for me, uh, I had gotten as much stimulation from the camaraderie as I was going to get in the first couple of years, I, l I learned at one of our presentations, we had an exhibition at the University in Nevada, and um, one of the founders uh, asked me why the pictures that I had brought with me were in the project. Um, she had said that if we show those pictures of dams and spillways and aqueducts, people will think you like them. And I felt I was embarrassed because I, I don't like, I love them. <laughs> um, <laughs> as, as anyone who makes photographs uh, tends to feel about subject matter. And I didn't have the, uh, the same kind of uh, passionate political um, 
Jim's mentality about lecturing. I didn't want to lecture anybody with photography. I wanted to show the magnificence and the, and the audacity of, of what we all collectively choose to do in the environment. So that was where I came from. And I think what uh, one of the questions you asked me early this, this spring, Becky, was how working with Mark affected my work. And I think in that collection of nine or 10 people, Mark was, if the founders and the uh, agenda were the center, center of that little solar system, um, I was Pluto or, <laughs> or one of the, what's the one that's no longer a planet? <laughs> um, which, yeah, that, that w I felt like I was that one. And, uh, but I took a lot of uh, solace in watching Mark work because he, you seem never to become engaged in the political kind of passionate arguments. You simply, and this is something I learned about you way before that, a decade before that when I started looking at your work. The pictures seem to be <coughs> simply about, del not simply, but <coughs> primarily about delight in visual things. And of course then if you have enough sense to focus your, your attentions on things that are important and you, you're visually literate, all the better. And then if you get smarter and smarter as you work in your career, the pictures get better and better. And so that's what I've loved about, not, I can't say collaborating, but what I've loved about watching Mark work and learning from your work and your working. Um, so in that sense, Water in the West was, uh, I owe a great deal to, the, to uh, Bob Dawson and Ellen Manchester for pulling me in and for not kicking me out when any sensible person would have. But I... I, uh, I loved the immersion in subject matter, and uh, that's pretty much propelled me in my life in photography since then. So that's a long answer. I apologize for that. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Well, um, thanks, Marty. You know, I'd, I'm just going to show some pictures in the background while I'll say a couple things. One of the things that I brought into the project as my contribution was some re photography that I'd done in the Phoenix metro area that had to do with water. Um, you know, I was really interested in this group because everybody that was involved in it, you know, Marty and Bob and Ellen and, you know, Jeff Bricker and, you know, San Calsa and all the others, I mean, they, everybody was really passionate about uh, this, this topic. And I, I felt, I've always kind of felt that my interest in it wasn't to be. Um, you know, kind of an advocate for, for something on from the top um, down, but rather the bottom up. You know, this is the Ash Avenue Bridge in Tempe, and that's what it ended up looking like. I have, you know, this is a place where we kind of go, keep going back to and rethinking about how places have changed. So um, I liked, what I liked about the group was that uh, there was that passion, and it, it wasn't a, a thing where everybody was just trying to get ahead and carve their own space and you know um, like uh, there's this expression that a good friend of mine Yvonne Streetman used to use um, you know she'd say that like somebody licked the biscuit right you know and I said you said about Ansel Adams in Yosemite he licked the biscuit right so meaning that you're at the dinner table and some kid runs in and licks the biscuit and puts it down you're not going to eat that one you know somebody else licked it and in some ways, that this group was not about that. They weren't about claiming territory. They were about sharing um, ideas and sharing um, and, and supporting mutual support. So it wasn't the kind of collaboration. That's the same place, by the way. So like that's, that's the vision of Phoenix, right? It says the vision on the bottom, and then it became the Allegro apartment building. Um, and so you know, a lot of what um, I was interested in was just to be in a group that would would actually value that. And so it wasn't the kind of collaboration where we would go out and work together or do projects together. It was just more of a supportive kind of collaborative atmosphere. And I can uh, elaborate on that because I have this great quote from photographer and Water in the West member Terry Evans who said, quote, Mark has looked at my work on various occasions and given me useful suggestions, particularly in the area of book design and development. When I was working on my book, Prairie Stories, Mark saw it at various stages and made some suggestions. Here are some notes from a conversation with him in 2011. Quote, don't use the same relationship too often. Make changes at the end of a sequence. Change pace. Create a movement. Don't be repetitive. Create breaks, not endless sequences. Think about spatial relationships and time. Some images need a pause. 
quote. Sounds like Mark, doesn't it? By the way, these notes were back-of-the-envelope sort of scribbles that I'd stuck in a drawer with old labels and extra odds and ends like paper clips and pencils. But the fact that I knew right where to find them today speaks to their importance to me. So Terry mentioned that Water in the West was more of a collective than a collaboration. Mm -hmm. um, but this mm -hmm. element of mutual collegial support was one that you identified as a clear benefit of the group. Um, how did you identify that that kind of collegial support system was something that you wanted? I don't know. You know, I, um, I think at that time, this is like 1989, 1990, uh, I sort of, I mean, landscape photography was sort of, um, I think, splintering into uh, areas where um, I, I was feeling like a kind of competitive environment. Whether that was true or not, I don't know, but I think it was kind of a truth for me at that time. And I, I didn't really want to get engaged in that. I just felt like that was counterproductive. That if we, if we were all interested in similar things, then it wasn't about career moves or careerism. It was really about um, the things we really thought or felt strongly about. So to find a people, a group of people, and, and also because it was Alan and Bob and. I'd worked with Alan, and I knew Alan really well, and I and I, I trusted Alan, and I and I respected Alan, and I you know admired her for who she is. That I would feel comfortable in that that group, you know. So um, I did I did feel comfortable in that group. I think we we really did help each other and support each other, and give each other the kind of support that we needed without having to kind of see, feel like you were in it by yourself. Does that yeah. sound reasonable? Yeah, it yeah. does. I. <clears throat> um, the notion that it it was getting that it felt um, I'm sorry, go ahead. no 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 um, that it felt competitive is is an interesting notion and I wonder about um, you know whether or not that's do you feel like you um, is that still a factor do photographers still feel like they're they're forced into these competitive situations that they need to counteract. I don't know, you could ask about half the people in this room, probably, yeah. if, they, if they feel that way. I don't know, I mean, it might have just been me, but I, I think it, there was something out there um, at that time as well. I mean, I remember being at a, at, a land, at a conference called The Political Landscape that Jim Baker did at Anderson Ranch in 1989. It was really a good conference, but um, one of the things that happened at that conference was, um, you know, as a lot of us were presenting our work, and um, you know, I think we felt like we were all kind of in a, you know, we're all kind of in this thing together. But I mean, you know, who's who's presenting, who isn't presenting? Some of us were, some of us weren't. I mean, there was a kind of hierarchy there, which always happens. And I remember I did a talk um, there on my work, and I showed some of the, these pictures I'm showing now, and um, which I gave to the center here is part of the water in the west. Um, and, and I got done with a talk and this woman walks up to me and she says, um, you don't know it, but you're a new western historian. And I was like, well, okay, well, who are you? And it would turn out to be Patty Limerick, the historian. <laughs> you know, and, and then I went to her, to her talk, which is a keynote talk, like a little bit later, and I was blown away. I didn't know who she was, you know. And but what I loved about that was that she was saying to me and to other people, hey, you know, we're all doing the same thing. And why don't, you, why don't we join? Let's, you know, you're part of us. Join us, you know. And I thought that's a powerful thing for somebody to say, especially Patty, who was really at the top of her field, you know, for somebody to say that. Um, I was really impressed by that. And that's, you know, there's certain points in your career where you have to decide what kind of artist you want to be. And there's, that was one point or around that time I was trying to figure things out and I was thinking, that's the kind of thing I want to do. You know, that, that's what makes me feel good. And so is that then something that informs how you teach students? I mean, well, do you model that behavior? There's a few or do of you them here too, you can ask them. <laughs> <laughs> do, you, do you tell them directly, find, find a network, find well, peers, I think that's, find? Well, I think that's incumbent, you know, when you, so, you know, uh, you finish your graduate degree, and then you learn the secret handshake. <laughs> Some of you know what I'm talking about. <laughs> and uh, then you go out there in the world, and you go, 
it's like walking out the doors of the prison, right? And you go, okay, now what? <laughs> you know, so then, then you gotta, then you gotta do something. And, and the point is that, I mean, I've said this to people before, now is the time to choose your peers. Because at that point, you know, you have to develop that community. I mean, you may have a community if you're lucky. You may have already built it if you're a student. That's a smart thing to do. Uh, at least start on it. Um, and when you're a student, your community is your fellow students. But when you leave, then it's like, where is, is it gonna be the place you live? Is it gonna be national? Is it gonna be, you have to begin to understand what conversation you wanna be part of. And so that, that's the thing that has to happen. Um, yeah, it's a, it's a, it's a, you have to do it. There's no other choice. If you don't do it, then the likelihood of you continuing as an artist is not very high. Hmm. It's pretty slim. Yeah, interesting. So I'm gonna use that conversation as a segue to our next quote. Um, and I'm gonna quote author and critic um, and your collaborator for Yosemite and Time and Drowned River, Rebecca Solnit. So I asked, one of the questions I asked to Mark's collaborators were what were the biggest advantages of working collaboratively with him? And she said, quote, that everything arises from an ongoing conversation. What is this place? What does it mean? How do previous representations inform what we do? What are the larger stories and frameworks and questions to engage with? But also, his deep knowledge of place, of Western landscape photography, and incomparable geographical navigational orientation, an incredible eye for things others would miss, a pottery shard, a trace, a parallel, enrich my own experience and remind me how differently we see. The conversation shaped the writing, which is all mine, but arising from this collaboration, this conversation. So I'm wondering if you can talk about the process of working with Rebecca and Byron and I'm wondering if you can talk about whether or not it's categorically different from your other collaborations because it's been so persistent. Um, I think that with working with Rebecca, um, we, we knew from the start that it was gonna end up as a book, you know, because she's a writer. So that was a shift for me, I think, in you know, thinking about um, working most of the time. I mean, I have worked with other, you know, writers like Gary Nabin when we did um, Desert Legends, but a lot of the times you do the work and then the book becomes the reproduction of the work. And I think with this project, it became more about, um, that was the, the, the real venue for the work. I mean, I think in a lot of ways, the book was the natural product of the collaboration and that's what it should, should be. Um, so we, we started this at Rebecca's, it was Rebecca's idea, actually. She proposed the idea to me and I, and I suggested we get Byron together and start this project on Yosemite. And she had been working on, or she had just finished her book on Edward Moybridge. So she wanted to go back and look at his pictures in, in Yosemite. This is us at Yosemite looking at Polaroids and it's Byron and Rebecca and a couple of friends that she brought out with us. And um, you know, we, we would literally, the three of us go to Yosemite and um, try to find the locations of these pictures and then um, you know spend the time there and figure out what what we were seeing and what what happened was we we didn't have a place to stay in Yosemite so we um, we decided to camp at Mono Lake and uh, commute in Yosemite so it would be like an hour and a half commute every day into the valley from Mono Lake and then we would uh, talk that hour and a half. And it was just an amazing dialogue that came out of this thing. So a lot of the project was really born out of this dialogue and this, this commute that we had. And then after we got back from the field, then we, this, this email flurry would happen. Um, you know, Rebecca would send us the research she had been doing and things she was finding. And then we would send her pictures. And this is, a, we were filling in the gap here between two Moybridge pictures we realized that <clears throat> when we went there that, oh, they're pretty close to each other. In fact, they're looking in different directions, but we could maybe fill in the gap. So we did this thing where we plotted this course of pictures that kind of filled in the gap. And there's Rebecca standing on the bank. And, and then you know, this, this looks pretty simple, but it actually took us two days to figure this out. And then she, re she appears again the next day. And then we linked up the other one, the two pictures together. 
And so we did stuff like this, which was kind of a dis this thing of discovery when we were out in the field. And uh, so <clears throat> it was really a, a, a thing that we were working on um, together. You know, that she talked about the artifacts. This is an artifact we found at Ansel Adams' site where he made that famous picture of the, um, you know, uh, what's it called? The, uh, no, the um, Clearing Winter Storm. Yeah, that's the site of Clearing Winter Storm. It's now the site of a Disney toy. Yeah, <coughs> and then, um, and then this one was this one was really instructive, uh, which is in the show. But you know, we we didn't know that Ansel Adams was connected to Edward Weston, which was connected to Edward Moybridge. It was the Moybridge that brought us there. But then we saw all these other pictures, and then we ended up realizing we could put them together. You know. And the, Putting together the uh, Moy Bridge with a scene that's Byron swatting the mosquitoes, and then uh, we put, put embed the uh, Weston there, and then the Adams on top of that, and <coughs> it was really kind of a beautiful thing to figure this out because we realized at this point we could actually do multiple perspectives. We could put different people together, and w this was like pre-digital. We were still using Polaroid film but we would take the film back that night and scan it <coughs> on a scanner and then you know, put it together on the laptop and so we could get a sense of how this was going to work. Um, so we're talking about time, we're talking about place, we're talking about the Awani and that the, the they got kicked out and they, the, they, when they kicked them out they said, hey, we're gonna, they said to Chief Tanaya, we're going to name the lake after you, you know? and he said, it's already got a name. You know? And so Rebecca's telling us this story and, and then um, as we're there, this guy comes up to us and he says, hey, would you guys mind taking a picture of me with my camera? And so he walks out on those rocks and he's coming back now. Byron takes his picture with the camera and that's him coming back through the camera. And it turns out that um, he was camping in the trees right where Moybridge made his picture and he was, and he was spreading his wife's ashes in the trees. <laughs> she had, um, he had been there with her uh, 40 years earlier on their honeymoon and she had just died and now he was spreading his ashes. And, and so Rebecca writes about this and so the thing about what we realized you know, with, with working with a writer like Rebecca was that she could give this experience voice. You know, she could tell this story and um, it was just really moving you know, to realize that there were these layers of, of history, these layers of famous photographs and, and then this layer of experience that was highly personal and every time people came back to this place, they reinvented it. They, they recreated it through their experience. And then, then we were there and then we found this little toy camera right on the sand, right below where Weston, where, yeah, Weston and, and Moybridge stood. They stood like two feet from one another when they made their pictures. It was pretty incredible. Ghosts at, this, at the place. Yeah, and I don't know if that was your question or not. Yeah, was, no, yeah. that was exactly my question. Okay. <laughs> Um, I'm going to ask you to pull up the birthday portraits. Oh, yeah. Um, okay. And I'm going to call on another one of our audience uh, members. And after this, um, having Emily speak, I'm going to open it up to the audience for questions. So be thinking about that. So I'd like to introduce Emily Matias. And Emily is a photographer and a collaborator on the birthday portrait series and is also Mark's wife. Um, and so, Emily, I'm wondering if you would describe this project on which you're a collaborator and then maybe direct a question to Mark about it. Can I show the pictures in the background yeah, while you're doing that? Yeah. Should yeah. I stand up here? Okay. Yeah, sure. Wherever you're comfortable. It's on. Hello. Okay. Um, yeah, I just wanted to say that, first of all, Lena and I, Lena is our daughter who's in the birthday portraits. She and I conspired, oh, we <laughs> conspired to make sure she was born on Mark's birthday. <laughs> Otherwise, these pictures would never have been. <laughs> so there's the first part. There's the first collaboration. Um, she was also born on my uncle's birthday. So, um, But yeah, it's been um, going on, well, it's 25 years. Our daughter is 26 now. And this started when she was a year old. Um, apparently, it wasn't necessarily going to be uh, necessarily serious artwork at first, and it's, but it's definitely been a ritual, and 
The thing is that it's extremely important. It becomes more and more important, it seems like, each year. And the time is set aside, and we cannot do anything else that afternoon, that birthday afternoon. It's got to be about the same time, the same place in the yard. I think all but one year it's been in our backyard. So, um, so we see the changes of the people and the landscape as well. Um, so the interesting thing, I think, is how um, the photographs show what changes. You can see, of course, the different changes in their relationship, how close together, how far apart they are, um, and, of course, the physical changes, too. But what you don't see is the um, um, off the camera goings so, on, like okay. sometimes, especially going through early teens mm -hmm. with <laughs> our daughter right. not really wanting to do it, wanting to get it over with, and making silly faces and, uh, I don't know, doing cartwheels or whatever, just to kind of like, uh, you know, blow off some steam. Um, so, anyway. Um, and then, well, as far as the self-portrait part goes, uh, that, that's been real interesting throughout this time. Um, I'm actually doing a lot of self-portraiture too, so I'm more and more relating to what Mark is doing here. And I think that maybe one question I could ask you, Mark, is why do you need me behind the camera <laughs> now? <laughs> Especially with digital. Um, <laughs> I'm doing mine by myself a lot. <laughs> well, there you go. I mean, I've made a few pictures for you, too. I, I know. Yeah. <laughs> that was the one that wasn't in the backyard. But, you know, yeah, um, but I do need you, Emily, to do this because uh, the, way, the way that we started this, I'm, d and I'm just going to run, let me just finish the, the series here. Because Emily's the one who presses the shutter. And you know, I don't have like a little electronic thing or a little bulb thing down there. And even if I did, I wouldn't know what we look like. You know, you're you're looking at us and you're you're actually more tuned into expressions than I am and you're always like saying, You're frowning. <laughs> you know, you don't look good, you know, or you're, you're you know, lift your chin up, you know, yeah. or something. You're always telling That's me true. to do something. And, and I, don't, I don't know what I look like. I mean, I'm actually trying to stay the same. That's, <laughs> that's what I'm trying to do. Oh, it's not right. And um, this, this is the one that you don't have in the uh -huh. show yeah. because it's the most recent one oh. from uh, last uh, fall. And then um, I was going to show, see, what happened was that when we started this, I was using the Polaroid film. So this, we had a stack of Polaroids. And, when Lena was little, she, you know, wouldn't have much of this. So, you know, when at a certain point, you know, I'd have to bribe her, you know, I'd say, you know, try to give her something so she'd do one more. And I'd look at it and go, that's not very good. Do one more. I don't want to do it. Do one more, you know, try to get her to do one more. Then as she got to be older, she'd, she'd, she'd look at the prints and she'd go, I don't like that one. Do another one. And then I'd do one. And then, then she'd say, okay, I look good in that one. You're, we're done. <laughs> <laughs> and say, wait a minute, <laughs> what about the rest of it, you know? So she, she was like totally into, the, you know, how she looked at that point. Um, but then when we got to the digital part, see, when we were doing film, 4x5, you know, I would have to change the sheet of film every time. So you would have to use your judgment and say, okay, hold, well, and then you'd press the shutter. Right. Then I'd have to go stand up and change the film, and we'd sit down again, and you'd do another one. And so, but once we got to digital, then, then you could sort of fire it off a little bit more. Right. And I'm going to show these, because these are ones that we did that, like that's a color version. So we started to do color. I started shooting color actually about halfway through. I just haven't shown them. So I've got about half of these in color. But I'd like the black and white. And Lena likes the black and white better. So we use the black and white. Um, this is the picture of Emily. She's taking a picture of Lena with a shawl out of her head that, that day. But the camera is set up, and so I'm about to sit down. But this is the way it would look in the backyard, um, you know, with the camera set oh, up. Was this before your studio was built? Yeah, it's before the studio was built, yeah. And then um, here's a few other color ones you see, you sort of see. So now I do them in color as well as black and white. And recently, the last couple of years, I actually do them 
This is one that's an outtake. I actually do them now in um, digital, and I have I send the digital file in to get printed in black and white. They print it on the same paper that I do normally. In gelatin silver. In gelatin mean. silver, yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. And this this is like a, this is like a little animation. So these are outtakes. <laughs> so I mean I I really am I'm trying to be like the same you know and she's like climbing around <laughs> looking at me like come on, she gets really you know kind of upset at me. After a while. Excellent. Okay. Those are fun to see. Yeah. Okay.